Okay, I'm going to do a lecture on sexual attraction today. I'm going to break it into two parts. This is the first lecture, and then I'll have another one. I have people on here, but I'm going to do this lecture on animals because what I'm going to do is show how animals like mate and attract one another and then compare that with people. This is called sociobiology. Okay, so here are the grackles, for instance, and if you look, this is the male right here. And what the males do is they get down here and they'll compete. They'll try to outdance each other. He's in the tree, but they'll get on the ground. If you've been on campus, you might have seen them puffing up and they strut around. And what the lady does, here's the lady grackle. She evaluates <laughs> and she is like that guy. And so that's female choice and we'll get into this later. Okay, so I am going to talk about Charles Darwin. I love Charles Darwin. I'm not going to tell you you're a monkey, but I do believe people are fancy monkeys that wear clothes and take themselves way too seriously. But natural selection that you talked about in this book right here is all about traits that promote your survival. So now let me see if I can get fancy and get that off of here. And so if you have a thick woolly coat versus a thin coat when the winter time comes, you know what I mean? That's a trait that promotes your survival. Now sexual selection, which we're going to focus on this one a lot more today, is traits that promote mating success. For instance, I don't know if you get bored looking like Heidi Klum, that promotes your mating success because you're going to be attractive uh, by our society. Standards. Okay, so let me give you just a little brief whatever lesson in evolution 101. You see these two moths over here. One is white and one is black. And so they have a different trait. They're not the same. <laughs> Now, if I fly them over here to the tree, I'm very proud of this right here. You can see one of them has a trait that promotes its success as far as survival when the bird comes to eat them. Because this guy blends in. You can't see him right here, right? You can't see this guy. So this guy's going to get eaten. But what happened, you can't see over here, but over time in Britain, as the Industrial Revolution came around, it started to coat all the trees with this black suet. Now the trait that had promoted survival no longer does. And now this guy over here, he blends in and he survives better because of the changing conditions. This is kind of like Ice Age, but I don't want to get into the kids. Okay, so Charles Darwin has these four things. I'll just put them up here. I don't want you to write all this stuff down, but you can come back and look at this, but we're not all the same. And a lot of that's due to DNA. I'm born different than you. And some of our birth traits promote our survival, that's natural selection, our reproductive success, like the Heidi Klum example. And so if you look at variation with respect to certain traits, that, that variation in DNA up here, which I'm over here, genetic variation, we're not all born the same, DNA is different, right? predicts either I'm going to survive better than you if I'm more like the rock Dwayne Johnson I'll just knock you out <laughs> or I'm going to have an easy time getting dates right so we'll talk about both of these things but especially getting dates the main okay so here's a perfect example you see these house finches up here the male right here is brightly colored he's red now one of the dilemmas between natural and sexual selection that Charles Darwin couldn't figure out is this as you get brighter and brighter that's great because girls like you you get more mating opportunities but you also stand out to predators and so you have this trade-off. It's risky to be flamboyant, to have these real bright color feathers because you might get eaten, but you get a lot of lady success, okay? So if you're a duller male over here, you don't get a lot of lady success, but you'll live forever because the predators never see you. And so that's one of the things that Charles Darwin focused in on his plumage. And if I was in class, I would show a million movies about birds. I'm only going to show two today, but not right now. But the birds, just think about peacocks, but that kind of is a bad example because it chases off predators. But they have these big fancy colors. 
for instance, look at this bird. Why do you need to evolve to this degree, but this is to show off to the girls, but at the same time, you're showing off to the predators. You have this, you know, risk reward. You can see how crazy this one is. I just don't understand this one right here, like how long these things are. On. Are some of these birds right here? I love this one because it has this little pom pom on his rear. Now, this is called an African widow bird, and so there you can see they have a long tail. Some of them are three times as long as their little body up here. Now, the ladies like a male that has a long tail. <laughs> they don't like a short-tailed male. Okay, that says something about his DNA and about the kid she would have with him. We can get into this later. But if you're in the middle, you're kind of okay. You might get some lady action, but you don't get eaten. If you got a real long tail, you're going to have, I wish this didn't cut off, a lot of lady action, but you might get eaten. If I had the video right now, I'd show it in class. Now, over time, of course, because ladies pick longer tailed males, the babies don't, there's not a lot of these guys over here. Why? Because you're not mating with those guys. So the distribution gets tighter, if that makes sense from statistics, and they call this runaway selection, where at first they kind of liked a long tail, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger like a runaway train. I hope that term makes sense because we have runaway selection with all kinds of stuff. One of the examples I have is fake boobs. If men like boobs, then women are getting boobs that are so big, runaway selection, that it goes to the end of the uh, spectrum. Okay, so the lyre bird, you can see it has this crazy tail that's kind of like a lyre would be like that, right? <clears throat> the old school instrument, but it's not his tail I want to talk about. I'm fixing to show a video about the lyre bird and how he sings and how singing uh, with respect to the lyre bird is runaway selection. What bird has the most elaborate, the most complex, and the most beautiful song in the world? Well, I guess there are lots of contenders. But this bird must be one of them, the superb lyrebird of South Australia. He clears a space in the forest to serve as his concert platform. To persuade females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage. And he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. It's a very convincing impersonation. Even the original is fooled. He can imitate the calls of at least 20 different species. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. And that's a car alarm. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby.
Okay, so I hope you liked that video from the liar bird. I mean, it's unbelievable. That's really him doing the chainsaw and uh, the sawing sounds. The next thing has to do with the bird of paradise. I always think this guy looks like a, oops, I don't have my pen on. This guy looks like a little Dr. Seuss, like, you know, character. There's a lot of different kinds of bird of paradise. This is the six plumed bird of paradise, but I have another video and they have a lot uh, to do with the, the plumage but also the dancing or courting uh, dances that birds do. Less than 2% of the sunlight reaches the floor but even here there is extraordinary variety. In the great island of New Guinea there are 42 different species of birds of paradise, each more bizarre than the last. This guy, I really love him. So weird and dramatic. Wish the resolution was just a little bit better. This forest is so rich that nourishing food can be gathered very quickly. That leaves the male six-plumed bird of paradise with time to concentrate on other matters, like tidying up his display area. He cleans up his house before the lady comes over. Everything must be spick and span. So sweet. He's ready. I mean, why did it have to go to that extreme? That's why I'm showing this runaway selection. It's like the feathers, the dancing, everything is so extreme. Very impressive, but no one is watching. The superb bird of paradise calls to attract This the guy's trippier. And he has more luck. But what does he have to do to really impress her? She retires to consider her verdict. Just like a girl, I'm <laughs> being silly. It's like, I don't it's know. It's hard not to feel deflated when even your best isn't good enough. Okay, back to Charles Darwin. This is very important for the test. If you don't remember anything, totally remember this. Okay, so two different things he talked about. Enter, which is, let me get my pen. Kind of, let's say, for instance, how females choose males. This is one of the uh, criticisms of this, this research. It's about straight people, you know, heterosexual choice, assuming that you're going to mate and have kids so we can get into other things in my gender class. But anyway, males choose females too. Like they might choose females that have big boobs or a good figure or skinny or whatever else they pick based on. Okay, we'll get into this later. But like interstate goes across states, across sexes. Intrasexual is within sexes. Like an intrastate would be a state highway that only goes within Arizona, within males. How do males compete with other males? Like when I talked about the grackle, how do the males try to outdance each other and then the female comes in and chooses the male that's the best? Okay, here's my silly example. 
Females choose males. Lady frogs choose the males that can ribbit the deepest and blow this big thing up on their neck. You know, for some reason that's sexy. Why? It says something about his DNA and his virility. And if she has kids with him, you know, that her offspring will inherit, you know, this, you know, trait. Anyway... Since the males know that the ladies like this, <laughs> late at night down at the pond, let me see if I can get rid of some of this. What they'll do is they'll try to outrivet each other. I thought it would do all of it at the same time. And uh, so they'll get into this competition. So the competition then becomes intra, right, within the males. And then she comes and picks this guy. Why? Because he's the best. He's the best riveter. Here you see the intersexual selection choice. She drives the competition. It's driving the competition. Because if the choice was something different, then the males wouldn't focus on this. For instance, if guys didn't like boobs, girls wouldn't worry about what, how big their boobs were, right? And so this competition is getting driven by the choice up here, which is inter, always, across the sexes. And then this is within the sexes. Okay. So how choice is driving competition. We'll come back and I'll make this point again and again. Okay, so why do I keep saying it's female choice, not male choice? Why is it the lady grackle? Why is it the lady frog? Well, what Robert Trevor says, especially for mammals, let's focus on mammals, that females, if they have sex, have a relatively high level of risk and investment. What does this mean? Well, they can get pregnant. If they do get pregnant for women, they're gonna be pregnant for nine months. Then if the baby's born, they're probably gonna to have to take a lot of care of it when it's little and maybe breastfeed and nurture and do all this other stuff that men don't necessarily have to do. So men can have a low level of investment. And we could talk about other species like fish where you know certain fish have to like, you know, raise all the babies so they have all the investment and you know the risky would be um, vice versa. Now, if women have to do a lot of the child care and have to do the pregnancy and everything else, also women have a limited number of eggs right here, whereas men have an unlimited number of sperm, maybe, you know, relatively speaking. And women have this window from menarche, their first period, to menopause, their last one, to like have a baby, whereas men don't have this analogous window. Now, what up, according to these researchers, which I believe in, is that women are real fussy about who they have sex with. Why? Because they could get pregnant, they might have to take care of the kid, this, that, and the other. Even if there's birth control, that doesn't always work. Men, on the other hand, I don't know, it can be an absentee father. So they always have this option, this out, and so this kind of leads to the battle of the sexes. The men want to have a lot of sex with a lot of people, but, you know, that kind of behooves them because they could have babies with a lot of people and like, you know, whichever one works out great, but women are going, hey, wait a minute, this is me, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I got to be real fussy, I don't just have sex with anybody because I could end up with that kid and it's not the best DNA. So, I have these silly charts about this. In your lifetime, how many people have you had sex with, men versus women, the blues men? This is my all-time favorite graph I think I'll ever show. How long do you need to know somebody before you have sex with them? Is it one hour? Girls are going, no way. Is it one day? No. One week? No. Okay, maybe right around in here about six months. Men are going, uh, one hour maybe. You know what I mean? And so it's a silly, indiscriminate male. Same thing here. Okay, if we're going to marry each other, we're in agreement. But to have casual sex with? No, I don't care. Because here, the woman is still going, hey, I could accidentally get pregnant. And the guy's going, who cares? I'm just having sex. And so there's this differential, you know, equation that goes on for men and women based on evolutionary. Okay, so again, choice drives competition. I'm going to say this a million times. 
And if I'm going to choose, choose, see this word is choosing, enter, intra is compete, then I might have to have some specific goals in mind. Let's just say girls go shopping for a guy. The first goal, does he have good DNA? So what is his DNA like? Well, I can't do a karyotype, but it's like Gattaca. I don't know, this is an old movie now, but the, where we exchange is getting there. We're gonna have genetic counselors. It's like, here's my genetic profile. You know, I had it done, my karyotype. But for right now, I just look at somebody. And if I look at you, then I go, oh, I guess that says something about your DNA. Like the bullfrog's ribbit and how big he uh, can blow that thing up on his neck does say something about the, his virility and his DNA. It really does. Okay, the second thing she's going to go shopping for is, can this dude take care of me? I don't know if you can see this. House, money, take care of my kids. Is he big? You know, I always use Dwayne Johnson as an example. He's rich and big good thing okay so i'm gonna go back to the animals i got three examples i think that i'm gonna use as far as when the girls go shopping right female choice i have shopping on here i don't know why my pen doesn't write so good what do they look for okay so one of the things that they might look for as far as house finches is how ready he is I talked about this before. Okay, so ladies focus in on this. It's a sign of his virility. His DNA is good, blah, blah, blah. But it's not just that. What researchers started to notice, it's not just a sign of goal number one, good DNA, but it's also goal number two. So let me get into this. Over time, the ladies are gonna pick this. So that gets runaway selection, right? You get a little bit of that going on. But what they find is, the redder he is, not only has he got good DNA, he meets the first criterion of a shopping list, but he also feeds because in birds, I wish this wasn't on here, but he feeds the offspring better because birds take, uh, male birds take care of the offspring in certain species. And so this uh, creates, you know, a great scenario for the female. I couldn't think of what I was going to say because if she gets one and two, she's going to get a good guy, he's going to give her good kids, and he's going to take care of those kids. Okay, my second example, my favorite bird of all time is the bower bird. This guy right here, he's called the bower bird because he builds a bower. A bower is this little nest, and so this is the sap. Bird. And if we were in class, I would show, but you can see his nest is like a horseshoe. I should use a different color here. Maybe I can do this. Let's get all fancy on you. Well, you can't see that one either. Anyway, you can kind of see like it's a horseshoe right here on the ground. Okay, and so the horseshoe, if you can see over here that he has, um, then he starts putting little things in it. And sometimes they'll weave little things in here and they'll hang little ornaments and all kinds of crazy stuff that they do to him. And so why do they do that? Because the females like it. If I could go back to the other slide, she comes in and she evaluates based on all this stuff that he puts out. And if he like decorates his nest the best that she selects him. So again, choice in her. What is she shopping for? A fancy nest drives a competition, but it also meets some of the goals. It probably meets goal number one a little bit because he has good DNA, right? As she evaluates the nest, he's creative and he can procure things, but it definitely meets goal number two because he's getting stuff, protect and provide. Now, those aren't really, you know, pragmatic stuff that he's getting, but it's a sign that he can do stuff for her. A third example is the pied flycatcher. It's the simplest example. A lot of birds, what they really focus in on the ladybirds when they go shopping is the song of the bird, the male bird, I should say. In this case, what they find, you don't have to remember exactly, but if he has a fancier song, Basically, you don't have to remember all this, but repertoire, how many songs can he sing? Some song uh, birds can sing up to 300 different kinds of songs, you know what I mean? Versatility. And so the fancier he is in singing, scientists have found that that directly relates to how much food he has in his territory.
So maybe the ladybird doesn't know this exactly, but she's going to get a good singer, which means she, her sons might be good singers. Goal number one and goal number two, they're going to eat good. So I love these three examples. I hope I made good sense with them where the, when the ladies go shopping, whatever the trade is, how fancy the nest is, the song rate, how red the guy is, this is a sign of not only his DNA, but also his ability to take care of her young. Okay, so these are the two last things for today's lecture on sexual attraction. The first one is polygyny, poly, let me make sure my pen is on, poly means many, G-Y-N, think about gynecologists, many women. And so a lot of times males duke it out, like here are two elephant seals, and they'll get really bloody, like hippos, elephant seals, rams. I could bring in all kinds of examples if you were in class and show videos, but a lot of it's based on aggression for men. Not all competition, but a lot of male-male intrasexual competition between men uh, results in aggression. The most aggressive male wins, and then he has a harem of females, so he gets a bunch of wives so to speak. So if you think about this term alpha male, he's the winner and we use this term alpha male all the time in popular culture like the silverback gorilla. And we have the alpha male. The alpha male meets two criterion. Goal number one, good DNA, at least so it seems so. And goal number two for women, <clears throat> which is, uh, oh, protection. He can protect me. And so I love Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, and I have a big man crush on him, but if you think about it, look how good looking he is, good DNA, right? And also protection and provision, you're going to feel safe around him. Okay, so he's the alpha, and if you think about it in our culture, we have alphas, but I'm more of a beta if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> and so if you're a beta, you know your place in the pecking order, even if it's not a polygynous society, you still know your place in the packing order and it's based on, I can kick your ass. I mean, really it is for me. And if you think about MMA, it's the most ultimate demonstration. Okay, so for girls, poly, many, andro, men. And so this is a cotton top tamarind. In certain troops, the women are is more matriarchal, are the ones you know that are in charge, but only the women kind of band together. The men are nomadic, but only one of the women, I shouldn't say women, can have sex and only her, only she can come into what they call estrus, which would be like a woman's menstrual cycle and these girls though are of age they should be able to come into their cycle but there's something about the pheromones of this lady one that suppress her ability to even come into uh asterisk. i wanted to say menstruation and ovulate and so eventually these girls could rise up too, but they don't. Why? Because queen bees scent. And what happens is if they take the queen bee out of the cage for a while, this girl will come up and be the new queen bee. It's so weird. And now her scent will suppress everybody else's, sorry about my pen, and keep all them down because she's the new queen. But if they bring her back, she'll immediately go out of her cycle. Uh, this is a sneakier way. We're not fighting it out on the playground like men do. Think about this fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? One of my favorite movies. But instead, they're kind of fighting it out in a sneakier way. And I don't know if you love Mean Girls, but I love Mean Girls. And see, here's how you can see animals relating to people, sociobiology, but how they sneakily fight the plastics within the society of high school versus men just get out on the playground, fist fight, and have to duke it out. That's everything for today. I hope I did a good job. Now I'm going to segue into human attraction and how it mimics what the animals do on their shopping list of finding good DNA and somebody that will protect and provide for me.